Hello and welcome to my workshop. My name is Paul. I'm a luthier and bow maker based in Tasmania, Australia. In this series, I will share some of the projects I work on each week, giving you a glimpse over my shoulder as I work as though you were looking through the window into my workshop. So this is a Gliga 2 full-size violin um, and it unfortunately got accidentally dropped. Um, the bridge has snapped clean off it um, and the soundpost also fell over. The soundpost is an easy fix, we can, we can fix that, but uh, we'll have to uh, fit a new bridge. Um, it also took a bit of a hit up here, there's not a lot I can do about that. Um, it's a little bruised. I might be able to get the bruising out a little bit, but uh, um, thankfully, sometimes when these do break like that, they get dropped. You can get a, a sound, a crack. The soundpost can crack the top plate, which hasn't happened, and the back is also survived. So thankfully, the the soundpost just fell over. Um, so now I will be. Cutting a new bridge, start with a despair two tree blank. These um, retails are for the blank only, is roughly, uh, I think they're about $42 for the blank. Um, and I'm going to just show you how a uh, Luthia would go about setting, uh, cutting a, a, a bridge for a violin, um, or how I go about it. Um, and just to give you an idea, it's not just a case of buying a blank, a bridge blank from your local violin shop and standing it up under there and putting in and, and restringing it up. There's quite a lot more to it. Um, and, and you get quite a few people think, oh, I can just go and buy a new bridge from a local violin shop and stick it under there. And then they discover that it doesn't fit, the string height's wrong, the feet don't fit, nothing works, it doesn't sound any good. Um, and they take it to their violin shop. And uh, their Luthia will, will give them a price to, to repair it, and they're quite shocked at the, at the cost uh, because they're just not quite aware of, of what might go into cutting a new bridge for your violin. So, uh, without further ado, I'll start taking this one apart and go into showing you how uh, I cut a bridge. Start off and just take the off it. I'm not sure whether you can see here on the camera, but uh, and for the the um, fine tuners on the tailpiece has also made a few marks in the top, which is unfortunate however it doesn't seem to have actually cracked the top so just have to work with that so first things first we're going to clean it
Okay, so there's the chin rest all nicely cleaned up, ready to go back on. So we start off, uh, we want to measure our string length, or the, the, the point to the back of the bridge foot. So we, we uh, measure the distance from the, the front of the, um, the nut, where the, the strings leave the nut, to the front edge of the, of the, of the top. Comes in at uh, 13 centimeters or 130 millimeters, and then you take half of that distance again on top, which is uh, 19 and a half centimeters. And we make a little mark there. that out we take a bridge blank and hopefully you get this on the camera and you just line it up central so we'll just make a little mark there and through you can see from there uh, the angle's not the best but you can sort of see that the feet don't actually fit the top of the violin at all so they need to be fitted and uh, And the height is way too high. You can also just see the top of the heart across the top of the, the fingerboard there. That tends to suggest that uh, it's too too high. So by cutting those feet down and fitting them properly, you'll actually drop that bridge down a little. Swing this around a little bit so you get a bit of a little bit of me as well. So I'm looking at fitting the feet as well as removing a bit of a, a, a bit of material off the feet because just to drop the bridge, the overall bridge position down slightly to meet the heart. So that heart drops slightly. Sure, the bridge is sitting square to the angle on the top, which will mean it'll be light and lying back slightly.
Okay, so hopefully that's a better angle. Right. A little bit of a gap here and there, just to try and <laughs> absolutely spot on. Sitting better now. Yeah, almost spot on. So next what I do, um, some people will go straight to using chalk. I'll give that a piece of fine sandpaper just to small backwards and forwards movements. You need to make sure that you're holding the bridge square. And you're not moving it too far backwards and forwards or you'll distort the feet too much. Very small movements. Checking how it's sitting. Make sure it's square. So sort of see by the pattern on where the material is coming off as to where it's fitting and where it's possibly not. You can start to see. I'll bring you down and show you. You can start to see there how well the feet are fitting. Bit of a gap under the front of the, f of the right foot there, we'll need to address.
I'm so happy with how the fit is looking. And then again, you can use to moving chalk. So you rub chalk on the top of the instrument and then rub the, the feet on that and see where it's fitting. Um, I use uh, carbon paper. We can see there we get a mark on the bridge feet. And we'll then go through and just scrape away with a mark where it's where it's marked. You can see the coverage is fairly fairly good. It's sort of all over the majority of the areas of most both feet. A little area here where we're, where we're not touching, a few areas here and there that need to get a bit closer, but overall it's quite close. And then we'll just scrape those areas away until we're happy with the fit overall. The reason is you need to be so meticulous in getting the feet to fit. They transfer the vibrations, the sound from the from the strings through to your top plate of your instrument. So you get a high quality clear clarity of sound and, and prevent the chances of any vibration or any any buzzing can can come from bridge feet. They're not properly fitted. Uh, you never want to switch from the front face of your boat bridge um, to the back face at the front. that will throw you right out. Um, talking about that, I always uh, will use, you can see on the, on the grain of the bridge, there's a short side where you've got uh, these little flecks are small and you've got a side where the flecks are long. There's two different modes of thought one bit that, that 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 dictates on how your medullary rays are going through your bridge uh, through the through the quarter saw and timber and uh some people will say you've got to put the long rays at the front some people say put the long rays at the back i've always put the long rays at the back the short rays at the front um and that's how i set it up but uh, there are two those two different trains of thought and, and, and generally some people swear by it one way or the other if a player has a particular um, way in which they want their bridge fitted, then I'll defer to that in terms of whether they want the. But uh, personally, I don't think it has any difference in sound production. And by experience, I've found that uh, a good quality bridge blank is much more important in preventing the bridge from curving or, or bending over and fitting the feet correctly and getting the, the pressure of the strings transferred directly through to the top without the with, the with the bridge sitting square to the top if it's leaning back the bridge is going to be now likely to bend if it's leaning forward it's going to be bend the so the quality of the bridge blank and the quality of the fitment is far more important than these are fitting quite well um, in terms of sound quality I haven't uh, I haven't noticed the difference in the in the quality of sound
this instrument. A couple of spots where the varnish has been hollowed and marked from the previous foot. Um, quite happy with the fitment of the feet. Next step is to mark the height that you're going to trim the bridge down to. And you want to project five millimeters from the projection of the eastern side of the bridge and seven millimeters up on the G string side. And I have a uh, bridge blank from the lovely old maker WE Dolphin in uh, Melbourne. This is a good Australian maker. Which I use My pattern. Sometimes I kick the E string down a little bit. The E string on this is a little bit high. This is, so I just re angle it slightly. Um, just for the E string a bit. There's a nice sharp chisel. down to turn this around and try and show you what I'm doing here. And then turn it around this way and you can see again. This down to a few marks on this one, I made a bit of a mess of marking it, but I'll just run it down to the top marks on that and then. I think I said five and seven mil for the height of the strings. It's too. That's far too high. That's uh, cello height for uh, cello bridges. I don't know what I was thinking there. Um, the G string would be five mil. So it'd be five and three. Roughly, and then uh, sort of break it down from there. I tend to do it by sight and feel. Hey, no. What's up? Yeah. I'll just have a little look at that. Looks pretty good. A little high on the G string, possibly. Coming down a feet touch.
chai. Next we take our little uh, sun plane. And start shaping. Because it's a bit thicker on each corner because we've cut it down, we've got to take a little bit more off the corners in order to get a nice, nice sort of shape happening to it. It's a bit hard to explain how the you don't want it to be straight, it needs to sort of get a little bit thicker towards the middle of the section and helps sound production. string in but you also don't want to be too thick it's so nice no, that's not the best ex explanation not too thin not too thick roughly two millimeters I believe and then it sort of gets a little thicker one and a half to two millimeters at the at the E string and then uh, it gets a, it sort of works its way out to Two to two and a half at the G at the G string spot. A good rule of thumb if you're learning. A little bit off the heart of this one just because it's a little low. Uh, some people thin their run their bridges really thin and that gives a much brighter sound. Um, I prefer to try and keep a bit more balanced sound and if you thin it down too much it's, it's liable to bend and buckle too much. Um, a thicker bridge will give a slightly richer sound. Once we're happy with our shape. Run it down on the sandpaper. Start the set taking shape. Bridges are made of maple. This is aged, I believe, thirty year aged maple, made in France, the blanks. For your black blank, the harder the material is, the harder the the, the, the the older and harder the better quality the um, the, the raw timber is, and the, and the better sound you get, the better transfers the sound more evenly. The softer bridges tend to to buckle more easily, and they they, they have a more muting effect on your sound. Whereas a harder bridge will transmit the sound. More, 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 more cleanly. Now, 
marking off their strings positions. Always look at them and make sure that they look right rather than just wildly going off the pattern. No, it's just a little V nick. With a knife. Just use a little, uh, a very small round file. Just point those up. A nice string shape on them. Clean it up. Four hundred grit. It over with a bit of two and a half thousand grit. And a quick burnish with some leather. And the bridge is starting to take shape. So now we'll do some trimming. Just because I like to make it nice. Um, you don't, this trimming is it's purely aesthetic. It's not, uh, it's, it's not for any other reason. Just to take a plain looking bridge blank and give it a little bit of personality. Make it slightly unique.
I kind of fix it up in a way.
so we can see the stamp it's burnt in there nicely nice and square and a bit of a close-up on some of those trimmings Gives you an idea of the depth of the string grooves. Mm 